du mein fernes, unvergleichliches Bulgarien. O oh, you, my fine, Lass unrivaled Bulgaria, let the untiring Meeres murmur of your Black Sea wash Sie over the senses so full of hope. Bulgarien, Bulgaria, we're on Bildern. our way. Bulgaria, a holiday paradise for some, the gate to freedom for others. It's the 1980s. The world is still divided into two camps. The Iron Curtain runs across Europe. Bulgaria belongs to the communist Eastern Bloc, yet the country is still a magnet for tourists from all over the world from the East as well as the West. It's also a meeting place for people living in a divided Germany. Jürgen Cyrillic lives in the German Democratic Republic. In September 1988, he boards a plane in Leipzig. His destination, Bulgaria. We were on the first time we were traveling by plane for the first time, and we wanted to have a nice vacation here in Bulgaria at the sea. It was really a dream come true for me to travel outside East Germany for the first time. Up until then, I'd only been allowed to go on holiday within East Germany. It was total bliss to actually be able to leave the country. Every step outside the country must be officially registered and approved. Vacation trips, too. It's a long process, and one that Jürgen Cyrillic now has behind him. After just three hours in the air, he touches down in Bulgaria on the afternoon of September the 24th, 1988. His first big adventure away from home begins. the old airport terminal in Burgas. Back then, loud and full. Today, forgotten and bleak. Time here seems to have stood still, and memories come to life. A 24-year-old Jürgen Cyrillic is one of the more than 300,000 East German tourists who visit Bulgaria in 1988. He and a friend want to spend three weeks at a resort town called Sunny Beach. Going out, partying, meeting people, enjoying life, but always under a watchful eye from above. You were supposed to stay together in the group or form smaller groups and not approach anyone else, like West Germans, for example, since there were always many West Germans there. You weren't supposed to socialize much with others, but instead stay together with the East Germans who were there. Ever since the 1960s, informal workers from the East German Ministry for State Security have been present at Bulgaria's largest holiday destinations. The so-called operative groups have one task – keeping an eye on East German tourists. The two friends try to adhere to the unwritten rules and not draw attention to themselves. They must not raise any suspicion, because the vacation is only a pretext. We wanted to have a nice vacation here, but actually, we had other plans. Look confident. Act normal. Documents all in order at passport control, and the officers don't conduct any further checks. The smuggled West German money stays well hidden in the soles of Jürgen's shoes. Mission accomplished. No one suspected anything, and no one could know that we were going to make an escape attempt there, because any person who knew that would have gone to jail if they were investigated later. That's why we didn't tell anyone anything, not even our own parents. It was only us two, my friend and I. 
We came up with the plan ourselves, and not a single other person knew what we were planning to do down there. To prepare for the escape route from Burgas to Istanbul, we took a shell atlas with us that my parents had gotten as a gift from my uncle in the West. We looked at the route in there, from Burgas along the Black Sea toward Michurin, and then along this little road toward Malko Tarnovo. And that was our goal. Heinz. Heinz. I have a wonderful idea. Let's all go to Bulgaria. So how about we hitchhike? Those in Brigade 3 said they practically made it to Turkey. They were shocked by how much they liked it. Andy said the diving is like in the Mediterranean. At some point, we watched a really nice film. It had pictures in it where you could see the border and you could simply go up to it and cross over it and that there weren't lots of checkpoints there. And that's how we imagined it. But of course, reality is not like the movies. At this point in time, the two friends have no idea of the real danger facing them at the border. They are sure that they have planned everything correctly. With West German money and gold chains as payment in hand, Jürgen Cyrillic and his friend ride the bus towards Sunny Beach, a long beloved vacation spot for international tourists. And now, the two singing sisters from the German Democratic Republic. Chic bars and expensive restaurants. Only West Germans and tourists using a foreign currency can afford an evening out here. The reality is different for vacationers from East Germany. Only tourists from West Germany stay here. Bulgarians stay in the dingy bungalows right next door, as do the other guests who are also German but aren't lucky enough to live in Flensburg, Munich or Cologne. The hotels on the Bulgarian Riviera are divided by nationality and whether you belong to the East or the West. It's the same in the bars. One spot for the class enemy from the capitalist economies, with all the money. A different spot for the collective from the Eastern Bloc, with less money. A two-class society in vacation paradise. After arriving in Bulgaria, Jürgen Cyrillic is put up here. In our experience, the hotel wasn't exactly ideal. We had a relatively nice room, but when we showered, the whole place filled with water, and we had to wait a half hour for it to drain. And we had to check in with the reception when we wanted to leave the hotel. Today, the hotel is freshly renovated, modern and inviting. Back then, it was exclusively for vacationers from the Eastern Bloc. Jürgen Cyrillic is meeting Ivanka Atanasova again after 31 years. Once a translator, she now runs the hotel. Directly opposite is the famous Hotel Kuban, then one of the most luxurious hotels at Sunny Beach. Back to 1988, ten young men from West Germany are staying here. A great crowd to get in with. They always took us along and paid for everything. We didn't have much money with us, and we weren't allowed to exchange very much either. Everything was just restricted and limited, but they took us with them, took us to the nightclubs where we couldn't have gotten in otherwise. We got to be very good friends with them. And then we had the idea that maybe we could borrow one of their passports so that we could get on a ship 
and then go to Istanbul. And then one of them would take the passport back. But no one dared. It was simply too risky for them. Jürgen Cyrillic and his friend have to rethink their plan, but they don't give up on their original goal of escaping their country. The German Democratic Republic stopped being their homeland a long time ago. At the time, nobody thought that the border would open one day. That would never happen. It was simply unthinkable. That's why we absolutely wanted to leave, because we thought that the border would stay closed. It would always be like this, and we'd never get out of this country. The turning point came when I wanted to go visit my grandfather for his 80th birthday. My mother and I submitted a joint request. My mother was allowed to go, but my request was turned down. And then, three or four months later, my grandfather died. So my mother, my sister and I submitted another request. And I was turned down again. I said to myself, why should I keep living in this country when I'm treated this way? And I'm not even allowed to travel to my own grandfather's funeral. Why on earth should I keep living in this country? I have to try and escape somehow. I had done everything I was supposed to. I did my military service of one year and six months. I did my work and gladly put in overtime. I completed school and finished my vocational training. And then they treat you as if you're just a number and you get turned down for no reason, without anything. And that was it. October 3rd, 1988, 6.30 a.m. Yes, look, that's where you have to go. That's the area. The night was fitful, but there's no going back. This is the day they've been working toward for so long. They've spruced themselves up and hope to pass as West Germans. They leave their suitcases in the hotel room. After all, they're only going out hiking, right? Their real goal is the Stranger Mountains on the Bulgarian-Turkish border. Here is where I served as a border soldier. Here, from Malko Trnovo to Bulgari. I started my service in the Bulgarian border troops in the 1970s. When I joined, I wasn't a member of the Bulgarian Communist Party. But because of my future work and the fact that I was being sent to serve at the border, I was forced to join the Communist Party as an official member. You weren't allowed to serve so close to the national border and not be in the party. That was simply politics at the time. Although any of us could have fled at any moment if we decided to. One step and you were on the other side. One hundred and fifty-one Bulgarian border soldiers had deserted by the end of 1971. But this man never entertained the thought. On the contrary, he wanted to serve his state, his Bulgaria, and defend socialism. 
Most of the border violators who we caught at the time came from the socialist bloc. There were, for instance, Germans, Poles, Hungarians. They came to Bulgaria as holiday goers, but actually wanted to go to Western Europe via Turkey. By the end of 1989, in the People's Republic of Bulgaria, at least 339 people had been shot dead while attempting to escape. But the real number is probably far higher. Many incidents were not initially registered, and many documents were destroyed during the post-communist transition years. Over there, this is the old headquarters, or actually one part of them. I started my service in this building, behind the trees, and that there is the new building. He retired just under 10 years ago. He doesn't enjoy recalling his time as a border soldier. Border security remains a socially taboo topic in Bulgaria, even 30 years after the fall of the communist regime. He doesn't want to give his real name. We'll call him Stoyan Todorov. On October 3rd, 1988, a 37-year-old Stoyan Todorov is on patrol. The part of the border between Bulgaria and Turkey is a popular escape route. It's sparsely populated and densely wooded, offering protection and lots of hiding places. Stoyan Todorov is very focused. Each arrest and every success is rewarded with a special vacation or material gifts like watches or clothing. But every mistake results in tough sanctions, like hard labor or demotion. I don't think you could justify fleeing over the border. It was the duty of each and every one of us to catch those who tried to escape. In catching them, we didn't know why they were fleeing, if they had family there or if they were just looking for adventure. You simply didn't know. We had to catch them. That was our job. The remains of the Eastern Bloc's old fortified barrier. Stoyan Todorov is stationed at this fence. The well-raked farmland on both sides of the barrier helps in gathering evidence. Deceptive tactics such as walking backwards or putting down animal tracks are quickly uncovered by the border guards. Another obstacle, the densely planted and thorny trees directly behind the fence. And another still, each time the fence is touched, a silent alarm goes off at the nearest watchtower. And unbeknownst to most, the fortified barrier is not the final obstacle. The actual national border is located some two kilometers away. Two troops are usually sent out, one with a tracking dog in the direction of the barrier and the other in the direction of the border. Would-be escapees barely have a chance. It's in this area between the fortified barrier and the national border that the greatest number of people are killed. One victim among many was Gunter Pschera, a 23-year-old from Chemnitz. He was shot at the Bulgarian-Turkish border on September 1st, 1967.
This is the motorcycle that Gunter Pschera and his friend hid some 15 kilometers away from the border. The two strangers were noticed by village locals, who informed the authorities. The border soldiers opened fire at midnight, and Gunter Pschera was killed. His friend was seriously injured, but survived. East Germany's last victim at the Bulgarian border died just four months before the Berlin Wall came down. Did you shoot? No. No, I didn't shoot, not at people. But when someone who was trying to escape was already close to the actual border and it looked like he wouldn't be caught, then we would fire three shots into the air. These were warning shots, but there were also places where direct shots were fired without any warning. I'm talking about the state border, which was far away from the barrier. If someone hadn't given themselves up, then shots were fired directly at them. But in this case, the border units had orders to fire at persons' limbs, if possible. The goal was to stop them, but keep them alive. But yes, there were some deaths, too. For example, in the surrounding bushes, we couldn't see people in there. The bushes were too big and too dense. You only saw how the leaves rustled back and forth. They were very dense. In this case, you shot directly. But like I said, when it was possible, people weren't directly targeted, so that they could be interrogated to find out if anybody else knew about their plans. We had no idea that they'd shoot people there and that the border was so extensively guarded, and that the whole border zone was practically more secure than in East Germany. We will sacrifice our young lives to keep the border between the two worlds sealed and unreachable for the enemy. That's what young border soldiers wrote in a telegram to the Interior Ministry in the 1950s. The border soldiers have to be proper men if they are stationed along the border. You have to shoot faster than the enemy, have better accuracy than he does. For the muzzle of a weapon is where the division between our two worlds begins. Worlds that are rivals through no fault of our own. Even local villagers are recruited for the ideological battle. Citizens who live near the border are taught to recognize strangers, to inspect them, and to stop them leaving until border troops arrive. They are given firearms and trained by soldiers. Even children learn how to handle weapons. It's part of education in socialist Bulgaria. They learn to recognize tracks in the border strip.
In a class called Young Border Guards, Stanka Papazova also learned to identify tracks, use weapons and recognise the enemy. She grew up in a small village directly on the border between Bulgaria and Turkey. Her house is the last one before the woods begin. The fortified barrier was only 500 metres away as the crow flies. She used to walk the path towards the barrier every day as her family's fields were close to the fence. I found this sign in the woods a few years ago and I took it with me. Today it helps support my garden fence so that the animals can't get in. On the sign, it says border zone. Before 1989, the town was part of the border area, and it is again today. Back then, we were told to pay attention to any foreign person we saw in town and to notify the authorities right away. The village of Brashlian. Back then, it had a school, a bar, and a schnapps distillery. Today, it is nearly abandoned. Before 1989, the village belonged to Zone 2, which was made up of all the villages close to the fortified barrier. Only local residents and people on the so-called open list who had official documents were allowed into the area. Otherwise, entry to the village was strictly forbidden. We were seven or eight years old, and word got around town that there were people trying to escape. We children ran there to see what was going on. They were there below, a man and a woman who were trying to get across the border. But the soldiers had already surrounded them, and we weren't allowed to get any closer. We only made it to a little cottage, and we watched from there. It was the tiny village chapel. Then suddenly we heard two shots. The man shot the woman first, and then shot himself. And that was it. Both of them were buried there immediately. The soldiers dug the graves and put the bodies in them. Malko Turnovo is 11 kilometers away from Stanka Papazova's village. Back in 1988, the little border town was also Jürgen Cyrillik's destination. He and his friend planned to stroll inconspicuously through the woods. The two friends first ride to Burgas, then take a taxi to Michurin, all the way in the south of Bulgaria. They've made it to the middle of the border area. Here, every stranger is automatically suspected of attempted escape. They ask village locals if somebody could take them in the direction of the border, and they offer them foreign currency. But everyone says no, it's too dangerous. They decide to continue on foot. On this early Monday morning, the two friends have no way to foresee what will take place in just a few hours, according to the written report from the Bulgarian border troops. They are sure that they've planned everything well. There were no road markings. There was no bus. There was nothing. It was a tiny, narrow road, pretty run down, and not that busy. It had signs that said, border zone. We saw them, but we knew exactly where we wanted to go. What we didn't know was how far in front of the border the signs had been placed, and that they were informing us that we were already entering the border area. We had always thought that it would be just like in the movie we saw, that you could go straight up to the border and there'd be just a bridge or a barrier you would cross. We had no idea how wide the border would be. I saw a van coming toward us in the distance. I'd hoped that my friend wouldn't stop it, but he flagged it down and it stopped an olive-green van. My friend talked a lot, 
and tried to establish a connection with the driver. He told him that he was a tourist from Hamburg and that he wanted to go hiking here. Busfahrer aufzunehmen und den zu erzählen, er ist eben aus Hamburg und er ist Tourist, er will hier wandern gehen. They try to bribe the driver using West German marks and a pocket calendar, but all in vain. Mistrust grows on both sides. Und in mir kam dann nur noch die I was really scared. What could we do to get out of the situation? I thought maybe we could seize the van. I could have easily driven it. But we scratched that plan. Then suddenly, the bus stops, 13 kilometers away from the border to Turkey, 13 kilometers away from freedom. They have to get off and wait on the side of the road, with two border police watching. And then a jeep came driving towards us. They told us to stand up and handcuffed us. They put bags over our heads and threw us into the jeep. And then we drove for what felt like one or two hours. We didn't know where they were taking us. It was a feeling you simply can't describe. It was intense. Uncertainty, fear. They are interrogated the very same day. Jürgen Cyrillic is up first. He spends six hours in the interrogation room. He tries to stick to the deal that he and his friend came up with. Not one word about the planned escape. A well-honed lie. These questions over and over again. And the interrogation lasted a long time. And I told him that we had wanted to visit the border area for the first time and see what it was like. The deal was that we wouldn't say anything about wanting to escape. But during the course of the hours-long questioning, they told us what the area looked like and that we were lucky not to have been shot. I was so emotionally worn out that I told myself it made no sense to keep lying and telling them a made-up story. So I admitted that I had wanted to escape from Bulgaria into Turkey and then travel onward to my relatives in West Germany. It's behind these walls that Jürgen Cyrillic spends the first days after the attempted escape. Ten days of solitary confinement. Ten days of darkness. There was only a 10-liter can of drinking water. There was a wooden spoon. But there was such a thick layer of filth on it that no one could seriously believe that anyone would use it to eat. The toilet was just a bucket. It stayed in the cell and was only emptied once a day. After that, Jürgen Cyrillic is transferred to the central prison in Sofia. Three people share a cell that is three by four meters. He meets a fellow countryman. One of the men and his wife had been walking in the border area with their two children and a dog. Then they saw a fence and thought to themselves, we can try it now, there's no one around. They got past the border fence and were going toward the border. And then all of a sudden, they heard shots. Stop, stay where you are. They seized the whole family. The dog reacted aggressively, and they shot it on the spot. They locked up the husband and wife and had the children picked up by relatives. The man and the wife, they 
abholen lassen. Man sollte auf uns hören. One should listen to us when we say time and time again that we provide for order on the border and we make sure that it is kept and for good reason. Whoever wants to cross the GDR's border needs permission to do so. Otherwise one should stay away. Whoever takes that risk will die. In November 1988, Jürgen Cyrillic is transported back to East Germany and put on trial. We were above the clouds and the sun was shining. We were being brought back to Berlin. Before landing, all the window blinds were pulled down. We were then taken to court. It was closed to the public, and all the judges were sitting there and treating it like it was some high crime to leave the GDR. And how could we have possibly thought to do so when we had received everything from the state and had been able to do vocational training? How could we have even considered trying to escape? And then came the sentence, one year and six months for a serious attempt to escape from East Germany. Stoyan Todorov's old summer uniform, dug out of the basement, together with the white gloves that were worn in parades back then. He's proud of having served his country. He couldn't find the expensive wristwatch that he received as a reward for an arrest. But there are other keepsakes from those times. I never thought that 31 years later someone would come along who was interested in what happened back then. It's unbelievable. I don't have anything against meeting him. I'm even curious to see him again after so many years, to shake his hand and to forgive each other. Now we all live in the same zone, in a free Europe. I don't actually know, was he married at the time? No, no. Does he have children? Yes, he has four. Well done. I don't hold anything against the man. It's just the way it was. 31 years later, so many things in the world have changed yet again. That's just the way it goes. The thing nobody expected was that the wall would come down, that everything would become freer and more open. That was totally unforeseeable for us. We just had that chance. We simply tried it, tried to seize the opportunity. Wait a minute, will I recognize you? I am Jürgen Cyrulik. Welcome once again to Bulgaria. I never thought I would meet the man who arrested me in Bulgaria 31 years ago. Do you recognize me? Do you remember me at all? Not really. Maybe just a little bit from your facial features. It's been a long time. But you know, there were so many people who came through here. So many. You were just doing your job. But all that's in the past. I'd like us... Well, I'd like us to forgive each other. We are brothers in the same family now. Bulgaria, Germany... We should let bygones be bygones and start a new chapter. The times are completely different now. 
And we live today and not in the past. Jürgen Cyrillic was released early from prison. Since then, he has lived in southern Germany and worked as a warehouse clerk. Stoyan Todorov stayed in the border region. His son also became a guard, watching over the new border. Many years after the fall of communism, a new fence has gone up here. Its goal? To prevent people from other parts of the world entering the European Union. Since 2007, the Bulgarian-Turkish border has been the EU's external border. 